What's up everyone? We are back with another True Detective Season 4 Deep Dive, this time for Episode 5. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been riding with us already, welcome back. Good to have you guys with us, and I have to say, I like this one a lot better than Episodes 3 and 4. Yeah, agree there, Damon. Episode 5 got pretty crazy, so no time to waste. Let's get going. It's New Year's Eve, the 14th day of night. We start the case off with Danvers interrogating Otis Heist, who's staying at the lighthouse and suffering from heroin withdrawals. Otis says he knew about Salal, but didn't know any of the men there, so it seems that Clark found him. Clark wants to know how Otis survived his injuries. We don't know what Otis ended up telling him. Before Clark ran off, he told Otis that she's awake and that he had to hide from her, presumably in night country. So what happened to Otis 30 years ago in the caves? How did he get so mangled? Well, there was a cave in and some of the men got trapped in the ice and died. Otis and the rest of the men ran out for help, but there was a blizzard. Otis then heard something screaming and howling. The other men followed the sound. Otis tried to follow, but then blacked out and woke up in the hospital with his eye and ear injuries. Danvers pulls out a physical map and has Otis point out where the entrance of the cave is. The caves are dangerous because of the thin ice, so you need to be careful where you step. Danvers wants Otis to be their guide, but he refuses unless she can get him some heroin. Danvers and Navarro end up going to the caves solo. That screaming and howling points us back in the direction of the supernatural. This could be a hint at a Sedna reveal. The other alternative solution is that maybe this was a man-made, or rather woman-made, targeted killing of the scientists. Based on some clues that we've seen, whether it was Blair's fingerprints supposed on the actual clothes at the Salal scene, we're not really sure where it's going from here, but there is a strong hint that some undercurrent of revenge was taken. Clark's interest in Otis and his injuries are odd, especially with the other scientists from his crew also experiencing those injuries when they were killed. Maybe he was just fascinated as a man of science. We're getting an inkling that Clark sold his boys out due to their complicity in something that we'll dive into a bit later here. I'm pretty much going to rule out the idea that the cause of their death was pure hallucination. It could have been hallucination induced by a group of people trying to get revenge. I don't think it was just a random occurrence of hallucination that caused them to go out on the ice and then end up with these injuries, etc. So Danvers and Navarro do pull up to the caves, but the entrance has been sealed shut. So it looks like a dead end, but fortunately Pete Pryor continues to do elite research and actually follows the money trail. So we know that Tuttle United is funding the grants that kept Salal running. Well, Tuttle has partnered on numerous deals with a company called Norbank Securities, which is a founding partner of Silver Sky. Basically the mine bankrolls Salal and Salal pushes out fake pollution numbers to cover the mine's ass. I can't help but picturing the Tuttle family running some Wolf of Wall Street type of operation with all these investments in shell companies here. I'm not fucking leaving! <laughs> we knew that this mine was bullshit because of all the buildup. Salal covering for them is probably what drove Clark over the edge. He was for sure the dude that tipped off Andy about the evidence, probably pollutant related in the caves, since he was aware of the scheme from the jump. Post death, he probably wanted revenge so he facilitated whatever murked these boys. That's the best I've got. And speaking of the mine, Kate McKittrick then wants to meet with Danvers, and Connolly is present as well. Side note, I would definitely smash McKittrick. So McKittrick plays Danvers some footage from earlier in the day, which shows her and Navarro snooping around the ice caves. Why was Danvers there? Danvers says it's related to the Salal investigation, and McKittrick asks how it's related. Now at this point, I don't think Danvers should have said anything, but for some reason she decides to blurt out all of the important details. She mentions that they have an engineer with information about Raymond Clark and the area around the caves. When McKittrick asks who the engineer is, Danvers just straight up tells her, my goodness, no cat and mouse game, no need for Kate McKittrick to work for it, she just straight up tells her. So McKittrick and Connolly then try to say the case isn't actually a murder case, so Danvers can lay off. Forensics came back on the bodies and they said it was an accident, a slab avalanche or something like that that started moving at 100 miles per hour, buried the guys. The theory is that they went out to watch the last sunset and then froze to death. The injuries they have can be explained by the flash freeze. Obvious bullshit and Danvers pushes back by saying she knows the mine bankrolls Salal and pays for the group that verifies their pollution numbers. McKittrick storms out to let Connolly talk to Danvers instead. He then drops the bomb on Danvers and says he knows what happened with the William Wheeler case from three years prior. William Wheeler, 43 white male. It was a murder-suicide, except there was no suicide, was there? Potentially getting murder charges thrown on her while chasing a murder, 
is enough to get Danvers to drop the case for now. The Wheeler case rearing its head here felt right because that had to come back and bite them. Season 1 spoiler warning, there is some overlap with the Ledoux cover-up with the Wheeler case, which we've already mentioned before. The Ledoux cover-up actually ends up providing cover for the killer to remain at large in Season 1. Even though it seemed like they got away with it, they paid a price too. McKittrick and Connolly are just cogs in the wheel of the system. We're familiar with this role in this game. So afterwards, McKittrick sets up a sketchy car meeting with none other than Hank. She says no matter what, Danvers cannot find the cave where Annie Kay was murdered. Otis Heist knows the location, so he's gotta go. McKittrick basically orders Hank to kill Otis. Otis Heist is a drug addict. Drug addicts get lost. We also learned that six years ago, Hank was involved in the Annie Kay cover-up by moving her body. In return, McKittrick paid him money and promised him the chief of police role, but Danvers got exiled to Dennis and became chief instead. If Hank can make Otis disappear, then the chief of police job is his. Hank's in a desperate spot too, because he gave all of his money away to the Russian bride scammer. McKittrick tells Hank to follow Danvers, since she'll lead him to Otis Heiss. Shout out John Hawks, because you can feel Hank's desperation oozing through the screen. After taking loss after loss, grabbing that chief job from Danvers seems like a worthy consolation prize. Wonder how many bands she had to drop to get him to relocate Annie on a dime like that? We don't always get to see the inner workings of a conspiracy play out on screen. I'm counting on you, Henry. Sometimes this season has struggled with what to reveal on screen and what to wrap up off screen. And here, they made the right call. Hank's not evil, he's just a desperate fool. So Navarro is washing clothes at the local laundromat when Kavik shows up with his friend Kenny. Oh, side note, the laundromat is actually run by Kayla's grandma, so that's why Danvers called her a laundromat grandma earlier in the season. Don't, don't give me that, laundromat grandma. Back to Kavik and Kenny. Kavik hands Navarro the spiral stone that she originally found at Tagak's place. Kenny tells Navarro that those stones were left as warning signs for hunters, letting them know where the ice was thin so they didn't fall in. The underground cave system is what's referred to as the Night Country. Okay, so for all the work that was done in Season 1 building up the spiral as a cult symbol, Issa Lopez explains it as a way for the locals to warn each other about thin ice. What? Uh, there's got to be something more to this because it simply deserves better. The caves will make a cool set piece, but I was expecting something more thorough to back up the symbol. Maybe the spiral also symbolizes the night country and the underground caves in general. So Navarro tells Dammers that they can get into night country by going to the highest point on the cave maps and then cracking the ice and going down. Danvers says they can't do shit because Connolly knows about the Wheeler case and will expose them if they keep pursuing the Annie Kay murder. Catching murder charges doesn't seem to phase Navarro, so she keeps moving forward with her quest for justice. At first, Danvers is down to give up, but then a conversation with Leah changes her mind. After realizing how many stillborn babies there have been in Ennis, clearly due to mind pollution, she gets a spark of fuck you energy and goes back to the station to get heroin for Otis Heiss. Brings me back to season one when Russ stole coke from the evidence lab. <laughs> Hank then returns to the station shortly after, since he's been tailing Danvers this entire time. She accuses him of snitching to Connolly about the Wheeler case. The man's guilty face says it all. This prompts Danvers to call Pete into her office to chew his ass out, because she knows that Hank was able to obtain evidence implicating Danvers and Navarro in the Wheeler case through Pete's laptop. This part is kind of convoluted, but guess what happened is that after Danvers told Pete about the Wheeler case, Pete started doing some solo work and digging deeper into what happened. He found that Danvers and Navarro had visited the Wheeler house 10 times before the alleged murder-suicide. He also found that Wheeler was left-handed. This is very important. If Wheeler actually shot himself in the head, the gunshot should have went in his left temple. Also, the blows on his dead girlfriend's face should have come from left to right. But the photos of her face show the blows coming from right to left, which would make more sense if Wheeler was right-handed. From checking her senior yearbook photos, Pete sees a birthmark above her left eyebrow. Yet in the photos showing her injuries, the birthmark is above her right eyebrow. So someone went in and flipped all of the photos the other way to make it look like the blows came from right to left. The bullet wound in Wheeler's head came from the right hand side. The rest of the evidence such as ballistics and forensic reports were lost in the flood. So obviously Danvers and Navarro shot Wheeler in the head from the right side, then realized it looked sketchy because his girlfriend's face would show that Wheeler was hitting her from the left. If he killed himself, the bullet wound would be on the left. Jesus Christ, that was a mouthful. I need a drink of water. 
I don't hate the idea and the opportunity for them to run some street justice on Wheeler. Like a flurry of stuff comes through in a way that isn't exactly smooth. However, the rising tension between Danvers and Pete was well acted enough to carry this one. Danvers then tells Pete he can't stay at Hank's place anymore since it's a security risk, so she does the very nice thing and puts Pete in her shack in the backyard. Minimal heat, nice lawn chairs, a bed. Pete is by far the most abused character in this show, which I'll cover later. Dude, I don't know. I might be staying with Hank and just making sure I lock my laptop away or something. This looks absolutely miserable. Danvers then pulls up to the lighthouse and tells Otis Heist that she's got heroin for him, and this is enough to get him to go with her. She brings Heist to her house and has him point out where the cave entrance should be, and he points to a point off of Nixick Pass. Danvers gives him some of that good old China Brown, and Heist has a party in the bathroom. Danvers also tells Navarro to pull up as well, but on the way there, she's got to stop on the road so some kid can do the scary pointing thing at her. Should have ran his little ass over, man. As Danvers is waiting for Heist to get high and for Navarro to arrive, Henry Hank Pryor shows up in the most creepy way ever. He tells Danvers that Conley wants him to bring in Otis Heist for a warrant. Danvers is sketched out by the whole thing, but Hank distracts her enough to get to the counter and grab her gun. At this point, Heist emerges and all hell breaks loose. Hank points the gun at Otis and tells him he's got to go with Hank. Danvers tries to de-escalate the situation, but there's nothing she can do. Otis is high, so his judgment isn't the best. He tries to escape, but that first step just isn't quick enough, and Hank puts a bullet right in his head. Hank then trains the gun on Danvers and gets her to back off. Otis is somehow still alive, but Hank finishes him with another shot to the dome. I gotta say, man, Hank is a serious marksman. Now, firing two bullets is going to cause a lot of noise, and good thing Pete has been living in Danvers' scary shack since he hears the commotion and pulls up with his own gun drawn, pointed at his father. Hank tells Pete to help him get Otis into the truck, while Danvers is telling Pete to calm down and not overreact. Hank then confesses that although he didn't kill Annie Kay, he did move her body. I didn't kill Annie Kay, I just moved her body. He tells Pete, blood is blood and then raises his gun at Danvers. Pete immediately shoots him in the head and kills Hank. A devastated Pete cries in Danvers' arms. This all escalated so quickly, but it's one of my favorite scenes of the season. The energy is frantic in a way that leaves you guessing right until the trigger, triggers actually, are pulled. Hank's desperation multiplies and we get an awesome payoff on the Danvers-Pete relationship to see where his loyalties truly lie. Lower your weapon, Pete. This scene had the juice of the massacre at Woodard's house in season 3 and the Ledoux raid, but throw in more feeling and connection to some essential characters. Won't lie though, it gave the vibe of that SNL skit with Bill Hader and Andy Samberg. Overall, still very well done. What you say? Navarro finally arrives to Danvers' house and sees the two dead bodies. Danvers wants to call Connolly, which would be dumb as fuck. Fortunately, Navarro has some sense and stops her from making a big mistake. It's true, Detective Danvers. You gotta cover it up. Navarro wants to make it look like Hank killed Otis, which is true, but then he had an accident while trying to dispose of the body. They'll need to make sure that Hank's body is never found. Pete volunteers to stay back and clean up the murder scene, while Danvers and Navarro use the storm as cover to get to the caves. Navarro tells Pete to get the bodies to Rose Agano and to tell Rose to take me to Julia. Our duo then drives to Night Country. Okay, crazy ass episode. Let's discuss some of the side plot and go deeper into specific characters. Starting with the mind protest, which was the biggest side plot in this episode. Leah and her girlfriend Sherry join a major protest outside of Silver Sky. Violence breaks out and Leah gets caught in the middle when another trooper starts beating on her. Sherry runs off on her and Navarro ends up saving her ass and beating up her fellow trooper. Young love, man. So fickle. Danvers is fed up with Leah's shit, so she actually has her put in the NS jail to teach her a lesson. Turns out Sherry was not about that life. I lost a little respect here. We saw this one coming for a minute with Leah somehow getting more active in her community. And Navarro is still a savage, but this has to come back on her somehow. Again, she's caught between the two worlds here. The law, who she is, and her culture, and what's right. I would like to actually get her a Nupiak name before the end of the season. I think that'll have a nice tie-in. Whether it's going to be meaningful towards the resolution of the mystery doesn't really matter, but I feel like she still is owed a little more character building here. Speaking of Danvers and Navarro, we finally get confirmation that they murdered Wheeler. While the mind tries to prevent them from finding out the truth about the Annie K murder, 
they both handle it in different ways. Navarro is more defiant, and she seemingly has nothing to lose now that Julia is gone, so she doesn't seem to care about catching murder charges and goes ahead with the investigation. Danvers actually gets spooked enough where she's down to drop the case, but seeing the dead babies changes her mind and gets her back on track. Also, in this episode, Navarro finally seems to let Kavik in a little bit more. We get this nice cuddling scene between them where Kavik is Little Spoon. In keeping with true detective tradition, a detective's not going to solve anything big unless they fully commit to something and take an obsessive stance on it. Navarro, welcome to the club. You have now qualified. Danvers, on the other hand, she's wrestling with her past and eventually says, fuck it, I'm going to do the right thing. Clearly the loss of her own child, Holden, and the understanding she's gaining for the Inupiaq community is helping to guide her. Also, her enemies are scumbags and she derives joy out of spiting them. Can't blame her. You knew she was going to come around to Navarro's cover-up idea because the consequences for giving Heist some H to smoke in her bathroom would have been massive. Now let's talk about Hank real quick, who in my opinion was the star of this episode. He struggles with the pressure he's dealing with from the mine and McKittrick. You can see the pain in his eyes when she orders him to kill Heist. Hank originally moved Annie Kay for the police chief job and for the money, but ultimately what did it bring him? Nothing. There's this one moment when he tells Pete a story of when he was younger. Pete was skating and fell through the ice and Hank had to hammer through in order to save young Pete. R.I.P. Hank, despite being a bastard, you were a wild card and will be missed. When Hank's in the front seat next to McKittrick, you know that when you're a scumbag, there's a reason somebody is asking you to do scumbag things. So I think a little bit of self-awareness creeps in. You do feel a little bad for him because he's starting to realize that people are using him in a certain way because they expect that kind of behavior of him because they know he's good for it. The way he works over Pete with a little manipulation just to get a slight leg up on this and get a head start on trying to get after Heist was pretty diabolical. And we can't talk about Hank without talking about his son who did murder him, Petey Pryor. Our man Pete is getting unfairly destroyed by everyone. His boss treats him like shit and makes him sleep in a shed where you can see his own breath. His bed is a lawn chair. Meanwhile, his wife Kayla kicks him out of the house. It's been barely two weeks into the investigation. Her husband is trying to solve the murder, but nope, he missed bath time for Darwin, so she kicks him out of the house. Sounds totally reasonable to me, man. Meanwhile, Leah is sitting in jail, telling Pete how badly he screwed up and calling him an asshole. For what again? Gaslighting at its finest. Also, let's not forget Pete's dad just brazenly breaking into his laptop. Kayla sucks. Leah really sucks. Danvers sucks. Connolly sucks. Hank sucks, but I kind of feel bad for him. Pete and Navarro are the only decent characters in my eyes. It is fitting that Pete was the one that pulled the trigger, even though it was shocking at the time. Pete is a character, not a lot's going right for him, right? He's got this huge groundbreaking case. He has hands down put the most work in to solve it. Like, I don't think anyone's really saying that enough in the show. If this is a stat line and the game is like, you know, we'll say it's in the third quarter, Danvers has taken probably 20 shots, made five of them, told people to ask the right questions about 50 times. That's the real question, Briar. Start asking questions. Fuck your games. Come on. Ask a question. I don't want to. You wanted to know. Ask me the fucking questions. Ask the questions, Pryor. So much so that she probably got tossed out of the huddle at halftime. Navarro's putting up a solid 22 and 15. Really putting in some hard-nosed rebounds. But Pete, man, he's throwing dimes. He's got to have like a solid 18, 10, and 9 line right now. He's a well-rounded player. Kind of running the floor general role. Putting in the work that nobody else is willing to. Now I just want to talk about annoying characters real quick. I'm struggling to decide who I dislike more, Kayla or Leah. I'm probably rolling with Kayla since she has zero redeeming qualities to me. She's not a good mom, because which good mom tries to give a hand job right in front of her son? At least Leah is supposed to be an angsty teenager and hey, you're just kind of supposed to be shitty when you're that age. But I'm sick of both of their shit. Leah telling Danvers she's not giving up on her made me irrationally angry. Also her preaching to Pete to be a better man while sitting in that jail cell got me pissed off as well. She really went zero to 100 with the whole divorce thing and I'm hoping that that just kind of boils over and gets tossed to the side because it's just not really fair to our man Pete. Lastly, let me just finish up with Rose. She helps Navarro break a small hole in the ice so that she can sprinkle Julia's ashes in the ocean. It's a very nice gesture, but then Navarro gets another one of her visions and starts walking out farther onto the ice, and it starts cracking beneath her. Fortunately, Rose is there and saves her. Apparently, Rose tried to call Navarro back, but she was in a trance walking out towards the sea. We know that Pete is going to have to bring the bodies to Rose, so we'll see in the next episode how much of a G Rose is. 
I'm happy Rose is reincorporated in a meaningful way. Would have been a waste of her as a character to just kind of let her chill on the sideline like that. Hoping that she comes to play next episode as well because you know we're going to go down into those caves and only a certain amount of people are ballsy enough to help out on this. Especially when we have Navarro and Danvers on the wrong side of all types of authority around these parts. Should be a nice finish. Well that does it for our episode 5 breakdown. One more episode left. Hopefully it's a banger. Appreciate everyone for watching. Catch y'all later.